Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry about our delay. We have had some technical issues, but we're ready to get started. Um, thank you for joining us for today's Ethanol Producer Magazine webinar. My name is Lisa Gibson. I'm the editor of Ethanol Producer Magazine, and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is titled Protein from an Ethanol Facility, Understanding Markets, Feed Adapt Adaptations, and Technologies, and is sponsored by FluidQuip Technologies. Before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Imagine if ethanol facilities had the opportunity to stabilize revenue independent of outside forces, protecting your investment, your hard work, and your dreams of the future. Producing ethanol was only the beginning. We were evolving the technology, creating new and sustainable uses for the same kernel of corn, creating higher value, more diverse products with it, providing additional revenue and more efficient use of the grain, delivering greater margins and opportunities. For 25 years, the Fluid Clip Technologies team has been engineering solutions to meet the needs of the ag processing industry. We are the leader in ethanol technology, engineering, and process solutions. We provide guaranteed technology, and we do it with a proven track record. Our team works with large and small operations, providing turnkey solutions with fully integrated custom technologies and services, engineered to produce results from the day they come online. Our expert team has now completed the largest ethanol plant bolt-on in the world, and at 50 plus million dollars, it is slated to pay for itself in only two years. With our help, we can transform your once vulnerable ethanol plant into a multifaceted processing plant capable of stable revenues for years to come. We are your partner in bringing world-changing scientific advancement to your community. Let's get started and find out how you can benefit from our patented processing technologies. Let us work together to increase your output, grow your customer base, and stabilize your income. Guaranteed. A big thank you to FluidQuip Technologies for sponsoring today. I have a few items I'd like to go over before we begin. First, today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to find it at ethanolproducer.com under the Events tab. Check there if you'd like to listen again to anything we talk about here today. Also, feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar using the question box on your screen. We will leave time for a Q&A at the very end of the program after all three speakers have delivered their presentations. If you'd like your question designated to a specific panelist, please indicate that. And with that, we're ready to begin. We have three speakers with us today, Neil Jekyll, who is a partner with FluidQuip Technologies, Albert Takon, Technical Director at Aquatic Farms, and Peter Williams, Senior Nutritionist with FluidQuip Technologies. We'd like to kick off this webinar with a poll question to get an idea of the types of industries that are represented in our audience here today. On your screen, Please select the industry that you're in, ethanol producer, ag marketing, feed industry, ethanol industry supplier, or other. And while your poll answers are coming in, I'm going to hand things off to our first speaker, Neil Jekyll, partner with FluidQuip Technologies. Go ahead, Neil. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for uh, taking your time this afternoon to uh, listen in to the webinar. We're excited to present some uh, some different and, and unique uh, perspectives of, of what's been going on in, in the feed additive world and the protein market world. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, go to the next slide. Perfect. All right. I know that everyone's filling out your uh, your survey. Your survey. We appreciate that. We'd just like to get an idea of kind of who's on the, who's on the call, who's listening into these webinars. But with that, they want to do a quick background for those who are new, might be listening in for the first time. Who FQT is and what we're about. We're an engineering technology firm. Uh, really, our core expertise stems from the corn wet milling and the bio bioethanol uh, industry and really basically bringing that, those unique novel solutions on how do we advance the, uh, the ethanol uh, plant from today to the true biorefinery of tomorrow. We're heavily uh, skilled in the engineering side, both mechanical and, and chemical side. We also have leading nutritionists, which you'll hear from here shortly with Pete, 
uh, as, as well as we have extensive experience in the construction management area. Today, our technologies are implied or utilized in more than two and a half billion gallons worldwide, and that includes locations in South America, Europe, China, and North America. With, with that, um, you really, when you look at the uh, margin environment today, the, uh, the ethanol industry, right, when you look kind of the historic performance in terms of we know we've seen, there's challenges out there, no doubt about that, right? And so what we see going forward is those lower highs and lower lows. So what it really means is we, we've kind of, we peaked from a commercialization, we peaked from a commoditization point of view. What that means going forward, right, we continue to see a margin compression, we continue to see market deterioration, there's just an overall lack of confidence in the core business, you know, the base just ethanol industry today, which ultimately leads a lot of boards and, and plants to, to lack of decisions or lack of, of knowing what to do, given some of the uncertainties out there. Um, from a, right, so we're really at a crossroads in this industry today in terms of what do we do, where do we go, what's in front of us, what's behind us. And when we look at the base ethanol plant, right, how it operates today, we really have three core products, right? We have an ethanol producing stream, which is the vast majority of our revenue. We have a fiber rich stream, DDGS, and, and corn oil. And a few plants do do some diversification into, uh, into self-generating electricity and, 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 and the CO2, but these really are the main majority components, which really gets us in a position of how do we realize or how do we move towards true, true biorefinery dream? And we're gonna talk through some of that today in terms of what are the hurdles and what are the, you know, how, how have we at FQT overcome those, those challenges in the, in the, in the industry? From, uh, in really gonna hit on a high level, the MSC technology, the maximized stillage co-product technology in terms of how do we get that diversification strategy? How does that apply to the plants? And what this technology is really about it is the focus is, on the right-hand side of the slide, really, it's a, it's a simple, multi-step separation process. And uniqueness about the technology is there's really multiple controls, there's multiple levels uh, within that system, which ultimately yields a very highly consistent product out the back end. And you'll hear a little bit from, from Albert and Pete around why is that so critical. Variability is the killer of value in the, in the animal feeding industry. So when you look at, the, look at the technology and what we've done, we have four plants operating today. We have uh, two online, uh, or two coming online very shortly, and a, and a third, a third plant that was just announced here shortly, and more coming. And, and, and these are the plants, they, they get that they gotta do something different. And what's unique about the technology, it's really set you up to continue to drive your energy costs down, improve your CI score, and also convert, you know, get into new products, new opportunities, new revenue streams, and moving away from the legislative driven uh, value. The other key thing is the technology. We have extensive patent portfolio on the technology as, as well, which is really key when looking at any technology out there. From the protein point of view, what it does, what it allows you to do on the back end of your facilities, take that whole stillage and it really drives that consistent, reliable, proven protein uh, a product, which is driven by the technology. The uniqueness of the technology gives a very consistent, uh, high quality, unlike anything else that, that's in the market or even being talked about out there. And that's a, that's a key differentiator of the MSC technology. And, and we've got more distinction or more data to share here in a little bit regarding regarding the, the consistent and, re, and regarding the, uh, the value of the product and, and how it's used. When you're looking at, you know, when you look back and say, okay, how do we get to where we're at? How do we get the four plants going and multiple more plants uh, coming online? It really stems from a robust feed product starts with a robust R&D uh, pathway. And this is just a snapshot of, of some of the trials that have been done. And we've done an extensive of 30 feeding trials with this product over the last 10 plus years. And that has really captivated the, the product to continue to drive its value and demand and, and its adaptation into the global feed, feed markets moving forward. Here's a quick, and this is probably the, the, the one we like the most because it really tells, it's like, here it is. Here's the reality. Here's what this product, this high protein product really sells for, right? There's a lot of chatter, a lot of noise in the industry around, oh, I can get this or we can get this. Well, this is what we are doing and we consistently have shown 
time and time again, we continue to drive the value higher and higher and higher. And that really stems back from that previous slide that I had show, shown uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the work that we have done on the product and the, and the consistency of it. This is a pricing chart supplied by CHS, one of the marketers. Uh, they work with UWGP on marketing the product. Uh, Flint Hills is also a marketer. They, uh, they utilize the brand name NextPro. And uh, you'll see here a few times throughout the presentation, we, from a technology viewpoint, we call it still Pro Fit 50. But in the marketplace today, you typically see it as A Plus Pro or as Next Pro. Really, when you go back, and this chart only goes back to 2017, but the product's being made since 2009, right, where we really started off as really just a, a, a slight premium over, over DDGS at the time, and we've continued to move that bar higher and higher and higher. And the key there is, is that doesn't happen overnight. So when a new product comes in the marketplace, it takes time, right? And that's the beauty of the folks coming on board now is it's been, the path has been, the pathway has been well paid for folks to come in at a much larger adaptation rate and a lot, and a much higher value to it, to the product as well. I want to switch gears a little bit here real quick and talk about a concept that, that we're really starting to hit more and more to a lot of these, a lot of the facilities out there. And what this gets back to is this chart is really about what we call net corn. And originally, when you look at our background, it is from the wet milling industry. And what wet mill does very well, right, it has the ability to, to drive the highest co-product credit. Today, in an ethanol plant, when you look at the chart here, our co-product credit is a fraction of, of what the wet mills can achieve when you're looking at a base ethanol plant of selling DDGS and corn oil. Right? Well, we know corn is the highest cost of ethanol, right? But what you're buying that corn for is you're buying the starch. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you get stuff along with that starch. You get fiber, oil, and protein. Right? Today, that just sticks, that just sits in a single pile, but a wet mill does a great job of pulling that pile apart. And that's what FQT is all about, is bringing that know how and technology of how do you pull that pile apart and create higher values for the individual components. And what this chart is showing here is that relative to a wet mill, an ethanol plant today is really at, 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 a, at, a, at a huge discount of 13 cents a gallon, 70, you know, roughly $17 million per year because it can't drive that co-product credit high enough. When you look at the uh, when you look at the co-product credit, right, you're looking at a relative dollar of the wet mill at $1.52 relative to the base ethanol plant at only $1.13, right? Well, how do we change that economics around really gets to the diversification strategy we talked about in terms of making these higher value co-products. How do we drive the protein, right, to drive the value of co-products higher? And with the F2T biorefinery concept that we're employing at these multiple plants today and going forward, it really drives that co-product credit, actually drives it higher than a wet mill which ultimately means relative to a wet mill, which is kind of what we say is that, is that based from a co-product credit point of view, we can now drive a substantial premium over your base ethanol plant because of that co-product is driving value, which, which, which ultimately drives down the cost of your corn, which is your number one cost that you're operating. So you, the technology not only gives you diversification, it lowers your cost to, to, to produce ethanol, which is ultimately what you're driving for is, is that low cost producer. So when you look at the, the big picture going forward, um, really what we're about is we help, we can really enable the facilities to enable that biorefinery dream, right? To make a protein, to make a fiber rich product, to make a oil rich product, to make yeast, to make sugars, to make biochemicals. This is the first step in multiple steps to allow a facility to be able to achieve that realization and, and really drive those margins much higher, right? With the, with, the, what, what, with the technologies we have today, we can drive that, tech, that value to 10 to 15 cents a gallon uh, incremental EBITDA over your baseline today. And today, if you're making five cents, you're happy. Most plants are break even. So it's a game changer out there to keep things going, to keep reinvesting in the next, in the next level of technologies. Because ultimately what we see, we can see a 50 cent plus margin opportunity with going to a true biorefinery. So 
One of the things we do is we love to teach and we love to educate our, our, our customers and our clients and our partners. And so we put together quite a few different white papers out there. You can go to our website. Um, there's a tab under resources there, and, and there's a bunch of different white papers. One of them we've done out there is really around how to select a technology, right? Because there's a lot of noise out there, because of the, the, the interest in, in doing something different, Right. We put together a paper and, and please, you know, utilize this in terms of, you know, challenge, challenge us, challenge others to go through and really say, OK, here are kind of the six key areas of what you should be looking at when looking at new technologies. Right. Is it ready for commercialization? What does that mean? Is it full scale? Has it been running for years? As I said, the MSC technology just celebrated its 10th year of commercial operations, uh, starting with the Badger State facility back in 2009. Right. If you're using new equipment, what's the reliability? Is it proven? Has it been used in this industry? Every unit operation we employ in our technology all comes from the wet mill uh, systems, which have been running for 30 or 40 years. Right. The big one, what's the regulatory? You know, when you look at the market, marketability of the product, the volume, the demand, is it really there? And what are the regulatory approvals that you need or regulatory hurdles, right, from APCO definitions or FDA requirements, things like that, adulteration of product concerns, right? Those are all key questions should be asked. Intellectual property, right? Do you have an FTO? Do you have a freedom to operate letter? That's an absolute critical one. Right? What's the depth of the technology provider? What, what's their balance sheet? How many have they installed? These are key questions. There's a whole list here. Same with the financials. Right? Ensure that it's risk adjusted. Anyone can put a set of financials together and promise you the world, but they need to be risk adjusted to really be a robust financial model. So, all that said, when you look at the the, the industry today, right? So, so the case for 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 co products, the case for protein diversification, it's here today. It's actually been here for a while. We've been really more focused on just kind of optimizing our ethanol plants. We're here today, really ready to get to that next wave of, of, of that. We are at the rebirth of the ethanol industry, in my opinion, and and we're ready to rock and roll and really move to that diversification, move away from just making a legislative driven revenue ethanol to making more market driven revenue co-products, i.e. protein. And so when you look at the headwinds out there, right? We know there's limited uh, limited products available, which limits your risk. If you're only making three products, corn oil, DDGS, and, and, and ethanol, and one of them is highly legislated driven, you're kind of held captive, right? So how do you how do you diversify, right? The big next one is overall, we are long on energy, we are short on protein. You'll continue to hear that message going forward. Right, and we talked about the uh, DDGS is really an imperfect feed. It's a square peg in a round hole scenario. It's just what's all left over because we want the starch, right? So we're just dealing with this product. Let's rip it apart and really optimize the value of that pile of, of what's left over after the ethanol conversion process. We have a lot of legislative uncertainty out there, right? We, we I don't even touch that one. That that that's that, that's a that's a whole other story there. And then global growth of ethanol, right? We just saw some news about Brazil limiting exports, importation. I mean, so those are a lot of headwinds. How do we get around those headwinds, Freddie? That's really where MSC, the protein technology, it is really the only proven uh, functional protein uh, system, you know, out there in the space today. Given the amount of, of tons that we produce, over 600,000 metric tons to date, we have about 150,000 tons online today growing. We're going to 2x that multiplier uh, in 2020. The system, as I said, has been running for 10 plus years. We've completed 30 plus feeding trials. We know this product like nothing else out there. And the other key thing is, I want to stress this point, is there is no, the, people like to claim we have a similar product to FQT. No, they don't. FQT's product is unique. It is different. All right. It's patented produced. And it, it, is, it, it is a game changer to the feed industry going forward, which you'll hear shortly from Albert and Pete. Um, and then also it just it, it generates revenue to allow the plants to do other things down the road. That's the key thing about this technology out there. So with that, um, uh, I know we've got another survey question coming in. I believe uh, Lisa will uh, post that up on the uh, on the system here shortly, or is it the next slide? Sorry about that. There we go. So um, to that point, right, we talked about the margins being tight so and the challenges and the headwinds within the ethanol industry. If everyone could just quickly select one of the uh, one of the uh, options in this next question, we would greatly appreciate that. 
And with that, we are now going to move over to Albert's presentation. Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, so uh, I just want to remind everyone, um, all attendees, that you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar. We'll discuss them at the end. Um, and if we don't have enough time for all of the questions that come in, those questions along with your contact information will be forwarded to the panelists so they can still uh, address whatever question you have about the material that they're going through today. So moving along, our next speaker is Albert Takeon, Technical Director at Aquatic Farms. Go ahead, Albert. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep, you're good to go, Albert. Okay, thank you. Um, I was asked to give an overview of, of the aquaculture sector and from a nutritional perspective, what things we are looking for with a new, with a new ingredient such as yours. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. The aquaculture sector is the fastest growing food sector globally for the last 10 years. In terms of feed, we produce over 51 million metric tons of feed. The important thing for you and for the listeners is that it's essentially an Asian phenomenon. Over 91% is produced in Asia, and most Asian countries, whether it's China, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, have to import their ingredients. And so, obviously, we have a product which potentially could fill that gap. As I said, the aquaculture sector is, is, is a sector that's worth $250 billion, and it's growing on average about 6% per year. Next slide, please. And so when you look at an ingredient, as a nutritionist, um, on the left-hand side there, I show the various factors that we have to consider um, when we select a product. And so I think the most important thing to just to say at the beginning, next slide please, is that fish and shrimp do not have a requirement for protein, for fat, for ash, or starch. They have a requirement for essential nutrients, over 35, 40 essential nutrients, including the essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, minerals, and vitamins. And so when we look at an ingredient, we protein sets the standard of the type of product, but it doesn't tell you the quality of the product. The quality of the product will only be shown when we look at the amino acid profile. So if we get back to the next slide, please. Okay, and so the first, the first four um, considerations of the nutritional profile is first of all the proximate composition, and so that means that you know when we see a new ingredient, we want to see its complete profile, not only the protein content, fat content, fiber content, or ash content, but also we want to know all the essential and non-essential amino acids. We want to know all the fats and essential fatty acids. We want if it has pigment. If it has lanthophils, chlorophyll, we want to know what things are there. It's really, really, really important, and that is the, the technical specification sheet that we, that we give the customer. The next slide shows the importance of, of minerals and, and vitamins. Again, we want a complete, you know, if you have minerals there, we want to know what, what you have and how much you have. It's so important, these analyses are very, very, very inexpensive, but in the end, if you want to sell a product, the ball is in your court to demonstrate that, that your product is not just a source of protein, but it's a source of several amino acids, of phosphorus, of many other nutrients. The more nutrients your product contains, the more likelihood somebody is going to buy your product. The same goes for vitamins. There are 14 different vitamins, and because we have a product that maybe has 20% yeast, in there it's going to have a lot of vitamins and so we want to know what levels they are the next slide um, again it's an important one and that is nutrient availability and that is that 
okay, we have so much protein, we have so many amino acids, but of that, how much is actually available to the animal that we are growing? And the way we do that is that we measure the digestibility of those um, nutrients. And so, for example, on the, on the photograph on the left, you can see typical um, R&D facilities. This is where I work in, in Brazil, for example, where we can measure the digestibility of any ingredient, collect the feces, measure the digestibility. And that way, you know, when you have your specification sheet, not only do you have your total amino acid profile, but also you have the digestibility value. Again, the important thing is from a, a feed manufacturer perspective, every batch of product is different. And so they are formulating on the basis of digestible nutrient basis. The next slide is a very important one, and that is anti-nutritional factors. One of the problems with most um, plant proteins or plant protein sources is that they might contain a variety of different anti-nutritional factors. And products from corn or maize have issues with protein inhibitors, phytic acids, estrogenic factors, invertase inhibitor, um, and also mycotoxin contamination. And so the next slide shows, um, sorry, I went, if we could just, um, well, can, we can leave it there. But basically, the history with DDGS, with many of these products, has been always mycotoxin, mycotoxin, mycotoxin. And so one of the first questions that someone is going to ask when they look at our product spec sheet is, okay, what mycotoxins do we have? What's the range? What's the variability like? Okay, it's going to be important. The next part are the contaminants. Again, depending on how we produce our products, we might add filtering aids, we might add, um, you know, and, and again, depending on how we, we store our product, the product might be contaminated with mycotoxins, with antibiotic residues, with adulterants. Again, it's, it's something that's very important. If we don't have any there, then we say so. It's important. If we, you know, if we have heavy metals, then we say, the cadmium is below a certain level. But again, the more information you put, the better. Again, the, the, the elephant in the room there are the mycotoxins, the one at the very top. And so the next slide shows um, really that um, the importance of, of mycotoxins. Again, it's something that, you know, when we process our product, it, it's usually already contaminated with mycotoxins. But also through processing, there are various ways where we can actually remove them. But again, it's very much the, the, the thing that we have to take care of from my perspective anyway. The next slide shows um, the sort of ranges of mycotoxins in, in different corn, corn gluten meal, DDGS. Again, the message from me, please, is it's on the radar screen. So if we're going to come along with a new product that's going to be better, then we need to flag that and, and we need to really promote that. Because all these mycotoxins cause um, reduced growth rate, reduced feed consumption, and also affect the immune system of the animals that we're trying to grow. Okay. The next slide shows... Um, so up till now, we've, we've talked about the nutritional spec. Um, of the product, but also the physical properties are very, very important. Particle size, bulk density, flowability, color, smell, solubility, water holding capacity. Again, for a feed manufacturer, the cost of grinding is is very, very expensive. So if we have a product that's that's under 100 microns or 250 microns, you know, again, it's 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 very important. Um, but these are, are, are fact that these are considerations that also should be on our technical specification sheet, not only the nutritional characteristics, but also the, the physical characteristics too. And then the important point is, is very, for a feed company to make a feed, you, you have to make it 365 days a year of a consistent quality. One of the problems in the past about DDGS 
and some of the products is the variability not only in quality but also in terms of mycotoxin contamination and so again quality is number one um, our speaker before mentioned it it's very 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 important and that is that you know we really need to demonstrate that our product is 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 stable i gave this this picture um shows the feed mill in norway just that feed mill produces 450,000 tons per year of salmon feed you know the as we will see later on the hook in our product is that we have also yeast in there and that's the hook that many of these large companies are going to want but what they're going to want more than anything else is is consist is a consistent product and so the next slide shows really the you know on the left side we we talked about the nutritional considerations but then on the right side it's it's about economic and market issues. It's about price, 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 price. Always it's about price. And then you have also potential market acceptability and sustainability issues, depending on the type of product that we have. We don't have those types of issues, but basically the consumer in the future wants to know where their food comes from, what, it, what the animals are being fed and where those ingredients come from too. So we have a good story to tell, and so it's important that that we we factor that into our 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 program, and then the I have a, just a few slides more. Um, the next slide shows the range before. I mean the the typical inclusion levels of corn gluten meal um, or DDGS or brewer's yeast in diets for fish or crustaceans. You can see the range. The ranges are quite quite nice, quite, quite respectable, but with your type of product, you could really get a lot more. Uh, the next slide shows, um, in the past, the, the, the limitations, I'm just summarizing what I've already said, the, the limitations to these types of products in, in the past has been, number one, variable, variable quality. Number two, mycotoxin contamination high fiber content. Um, if we got carotenoids in there, we want to know what carotenoids they are. For some species, it's not a problem. For other species, you know, we have to be careful about the pigmentation of the flesh that we're producing. And then finally, you've got the anti-nutritional factors. Okay, so those, that's, that's what's on the radar screen already for people. And the next couple of, of slides shows Again, this is just from my perspective. Um, what I like about the SP50 is that it does. It contains 20 to 25 percent yeast, and so that for me is is you know we're changing it from a protein source to a potentially a functional ingredient. Protein is basically cheap, and so if you have a a product that can deliver not only the the amino acids that I talked about, but also can deliver other other factors like um, like the yeast, which contain nucleotides, which are all all factor in the the formulation that a nutritionist does. Um, the other advantage is that it has a lower carbohydrate and fiber content compared to DGGS. Um, it's a unique blend. It has a much better amino acid profile than corn gluten meal did before, and it has a higher level of phosphorus, iron, and trace minerals. Than DGS, DGGS. Again, these are things that we need to promote. You know, it's not just the protein. I know that the protein determines the price sometimes in the market, but our product is has much more goodies inside it than 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 just the the amino acids. And again, the the, the thing that people are going to like a lot, a lot, and that is the that it contains yeast. And so we need to flag that. And the just two more slides left. Um, this slide shows you what we're up against. Fish meal, you know, sometimes we use fish meal as our gold standard. You know, we want our product has 50% protein, so we're, we can maybe price it just a bit below fish meal. The important thing to know about fish meal is that fish meal is not just a source of protein. Not only does it have an excellent amino acid profile, it's also a source of DHA, of EPA, of, of essential fatty acids. It's also a source of cholesterol. It's also a source 
of phospholipids. It's also a source of inositol-choline, many other nutrients. So if you want to replace fish meal as an ingredient, you have to also supply those other nutrients that that fish meal contains, if you get my meaning. But it's an important message to get. You know, fish meal is, is, is a pretty unique ingredient. And so this is my, uh, the next slide, sorry, is, is, is I think my, my final slide. Um, and my recommendation here is, okay, the, the first part there really is about our specific, you know, our technical specification sheets can't be, you know, just protein, fat, fiber, and, and a few other things. It has to be as complete as possible. And then the second part, which is probably the most important part, as a nutritionist, and I formulate seeds in, in many countries throughout the world, um, one of the first things we look at is for the results from feeding trials done on the product. And most of the time, the problem is the feeding trials are, are normally done, um, you know, under laboratory aquarium conditions. And really, the important thing is that you've got to take your product and test it in animals to market size and do the economics, do the organoleptic test, do the whole nine yards. You know, a nice, simple experiment done in university will do maybe to get past first base, but it won't get you to the to the big customers because they're, they're going to want to know, okay, what happens when we feed it for the whole life cycle? And, um, and that to me is really, 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 really important. And that is not only the the technical specification sheet, but also the, the the technical data on the trials that you have done with your intended target species. And um, for the last part, I think I said that that you, your product, if you can show the consistency, you know, it has potential for shrimp feeds five to twenty-five percent of the diet. I came back yesterday from Ecuador. Um, Ecuador produces about, has a feed market of about 900,000 tons just of shrimp feed. Again, with most of those shrimp feed ingredients, they have to import most of their, their ingredients. And this is true of, of most of the aquaculture countries, which are potential markets for us. And so my, my last message is, is really that that we have a good product, we have to not make the same mistakes as as we've done before, maybe with with our earlier products. But but now that we have added value to our product, we really need to flag that, and we need to flag consistency. So I think that's my last slide. So if you can go to the next, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, Albert. Then, our that's last. My last slide. Oh. Oh. Okay. Thanks, Albert. No Our last speaker yeah. today is Peter Williams. He's a senior nutritionist at Fluid Quip Technologies. Go ahead, Peter. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Albert, thank you very much indeed for a, an excellent sum, summary of what uh, nutritionists should be looking for. So before I go any further, let me just pick up from where you left off. Um, if you go onto the Fluid Quip website, you'll find and hopefully uh, an excellent product specification sheet, which will give you the amino acid content, the digestible amino, the digestibility of those amino acids will provide for you all the energy content of the material, the carotenoid content of the material, as much as the information that, that you would require to formulate with the product. So I hope, Albert, that we've taken your advice from previous meetings and tried to supply the information that the industry needs. Um, what I would like to do is to start with a few comments about protein. It's been recognized that that term, we are long in energy, short in protein. We're going to be short in pro for protein, protein for animal feed in the future. That message has come out strongly from Rabobank over the last five years. And if I go back only two weeks, when the new Animal Nutrition and Health Division of Cargill was formed, Dave Webster, the, the, the CEO of that division, said there will be a huge void in protein. We need protein. We're going to need to, to double our protein production 
by the year 2050. The one thing that I've come to realize is when you talk about protein, not all protein is the same. So why, when I come to the United States, should I be saying you need to look for alternative proteins? What about all the soybean we've got? Well, we started to learn that soybean is not the worldwide panacea that we used to once think it is. Um, people are now questioning the monoculture, the increased use of pesticides, land grabbing and human rights. Soybean has not quite got the reputation that it used to have in the past. <clears throat> we can produce it in large volumes, but if you want to get a non-GM soybean, it's practically impossible these days. As a nutritionist, we've also started to find that soybean is not the unique protein that we once thought it was. When we're feeding young animals, we're looking for more benign proteins, proteins which are more gentle to the gut. We know now that when we use excessive amounts of soybean, we can, um, we can produce an inflammation in the gut. So it's very important that we look for alternative sources of protein. When we find alternative sources of protein, we then need to consider what constitutes a commercial offer? What do we require in terms of a protein to get it in front of a nutritionist and to allow it to be formulated into diets? Coming from the feed industry, we used to have a benchmark a few years ago. If you can't produce for me 100,000 tons of that particular protein per annum, you're not going to get bin space in my feed mill. Um, feed mills can't operate with small quantities of unique proteins. They need a volume of material, and we used to say about 100,000 tons per annum, that allows you to take a full feed bin in the feed mill. <clears throat> you also need the, the fact that, okay, if my supply of proteins ceases from one source, where am I going to get the same protein immediately. A the one thing that a feed mill doesn't like to, to do is to change its formulations. That's the reliance, the resilience in the supply chain. Have you got resilience in the supply chain and have you got the uh, established logistics to get that material to me? When I'm using the material, can I get a reliable return on my investment when I buy the material? And as has been said before, is it consumer acceptable? What you're doing nowadays, the consumer wants to know what is the supply chain, where it is coming from, and are they willing to accept it? So that's the market components. I'm going to repeat a little bit of what Albert has just said. You need to then look at the nutritional requirements. Is, it, is that material regulatory compliant? Is there a regulation that covers the material and that I can put it into my feed without any recourse from any other source? Is the material safe? Have you got the documented nutritional content? And can you show me the efficacy of that material in your product? Albert mentioned the consistency of the quality. I'm going to show you we have measured the consistency of this, uh, of this particular product. We know that it is a consistent product. Can we get it into a least cost formulation? That means it needs to be cost competitive against the major alternative sources of protein. And I come to the bottom line here, which now becomes even more important. Albert stressed the value of the yeast in the product. More and more, we ask our feeds to do more than just supply the protein and energy, but become what we call functional feeds. Can those feeds be used and provide us with some added function? Neil referred to the process that we use to produce um, Still Pro 50. It is a high value protein coming from the, the whole stillage of the, the ethanol plant. 
It's a 50% protein. That's a very important point. Nowadays, we look for protein density. It's not sufficient just to have a good value protein. We need to make space in our ration by having a high density protein. So we've got a 50% a protein. That protein is a benign protein. It is not like the proteins in soybean, doesn't have the anti-nutritional components of soybean. And as has been mentioned, we've got a yeast content in that material. Now, I'm going to come to, that, to the yeast content in, in my next slide. We've done a lot of work to measure the biological availability of the protein, the ileal digestibility of the protein. We do that with Carl Parsons at the University of Illinois. The, the biological availability of our protein is about 90, over 90%. We've got a highly consistent value in the protein. When we measure the variability of the amino acids in the protein, the fiber in the protein, we've got a coefficient of variation of less than 6%, which is actually less than you get in batches of soybean meal. So we've got a highly consistent material. There's, there are no additional processing aids in this process. So there are no additional chemicals added to the process. There's nothing, there's nothing there that is going to adulterate the basic composition of the corn. Have we got resilience in the supply chain? Currently, we've got four plants operating and three coming under, constru under construction. Let's look at a couple of the key nutrients, the yeast content. Again, it's a 25% yeast on a dry matter basis in the protein. That gives us the manans and the glucans, which are re recognized as the immunostimulants in the protein. We can be quite precise in the level of yeast that we've got. We've got 25% with a coefficient of variation of less than 6%. And if you want to measure the level of manan and the level of beta-glucan, I've got it there for you. The second point is these products are dried. And we know that drying can have an effect on protein availability, particular lysine availability. We've taken a, made, put a lot of effort into measuring the available lysine in the product. Our available lysine is over 95% available. And that is 16 samples over multiple years from multiple sites. So we have got consistency both between plants and within batches uh, different batches from the same plant. A highly consistent, high-value, functional protein. We now come to say, right, we've got the protein, we've formulated with it. How does it work when we start feeding it to the animals? We've done over 30 trials, both in universities and, and research sites to demonstrate the efficacy of the protein when formulated into feed. We've looked at fish, at shrimp, turkey, pig, ruminant, and poultry. All these in, in, in a dossier of trials which we are quite comfortable to share with you. If you look at the two histograms on the right, I've shown you some, uh, some data from two recent trials that we've run. Albert said we need to do long-term trials in aquaculture. This is an 84-day trial with over 500 uh, Atlantic salmon. And we've shown we can put 10%, we can replace the protein in the diet uh, with 10% of Still Pro and get at least the equivalent performance of a very high-value commercial uh, salmon diet. I'll show you a little bit later some data that we've got on turkey trials. And again, we'll have then have a look at the economics. Let's go back to the salmon trial. Now, this was a North Atlantic salmon trial, a salmon diet formulation. So we've got over 50% of the diet is the um, byproduct proteins. We've also got two very high value, high quality proteins, a corn protein concentrate and a soya, uh, a soya protein concentrate. So we've replaced over 40% of the corn protein concentrate and the soya protein concentrate. I showed you previously that we've got good performance with this alternate diet. Let's look at what that does to the actual price of the diet. And we'll just look at the bottom line. 
we can replace those those soya protein and the and the MP real protein concentrates. If we formulate in with Stilpro at a price of five hundred dollars per ton, significantly higher than the price that Neil showed you we were getting earlier on, then I can actually give you an eight dollars per ton reduction in your diet costs. The material works well, formulates in well, um, replaces those high value soy protein concentrates and, and, and other high, high cost protein concentrates, which are actually coming in at over $900 a ton. And we'll still give you a reduction in your diet cost. Let's look at, in the same way at the, um, at the turkey trial. What I would like you to look at it particularly is the Stilpro 54% inclusion and the soya protein concentrate, which was our positive control. Um, we're going to do a, compar a cost comparison of those two diets. If we went a little bit higher with our, uh, with our Stilpro 50, we can actually get a 6% improvement in performance. But if I stick with the 4% SP50 inclusion rate, and the soya protein concentrate, our positive control, which was supposed to be the top spec diet, I can give you a diet reduction in cost of $10 per ton and still get the equivalent performance. That reduction in cost in, in, in the diet is exactly what the nutrition industry is looking for. And the price that we formulated Still Pro 50 in, in that particular trial, was $550 per ton. So we've shown it works well in aquaculture and um, uh, in, in, the, in the turkey pulp diet. Let's take one more turn. Let's look at the, uh, the, the material in ruminants. Just focus to the top right there in the rumen undegradable protein content of still pro 50 against one of the absolute market leaders, which was a soya protein bypass protein. The RUP level of still pro 50 is as high as the bypass protein uh, formulated from soya. If I then look at you, the performance data in the histogram underneath, you'll see that I can use my bypass protein from Stilpro 50 at 15% and get the uh, equivalent, if not better, performance from the product, uh, from the soy pass product at 20%. Okay, we've shown the product uh, works, this, this material that we recover from the, 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 the stillage process. The question that we always get is, what does that do to our DDGS, our traditional business? What happens to the DDGS when you remove this uh, com uh, protein component? I can say, bottom line, all the people that are using the MSC process at the present moment, nobody has ever taken a discount in their DDGS value. Now, why is that? There's not many um, new developments where you can show the pre versus the post effect on something like DDGS. This, this graph shows you what happens prior to the installation of MSC and then post MSC. Now, the first thing to note is that those lines of the, the, the pro-fat, the fat, the fiber, and, and the protein level Look at the post MSC versus the pre, and you can see the lines are much flatter. We've got a much more consistent product post MSC compared with pre MSC. We can actually measure that level of consistency. If you look at the little table underneath and, and look at the uh, standard deviations, you will find that we have nearly halved the standard deviation in the value of the protein, the fiber, and the profat value post-MSC compared with pre-MSC. In other words, we have a much more consistent product. The final point here is, look what ha happens to the actual the yellow line, the profat value. It hardly moves. It goes from 36.1 down to a slight drop, 34.7. 
In other words, it's still well above the 30% mark. And why is that? Because when we pull out some, the material to produce the still probe, we're also pulling out a little bit of the fiber, the, non, the neutral detergent fiber that we've had in the product originally. And because the whole DDGS is a concentration measure, we have that high concentration of protein and fat in the residual uh, DDGS. So no discount in your DDGS value. In actual fact, when we come to measure the ileal digestibility of those proteins in the DDGS, we can find they are actually slightly higher in the post-MSC DDGS because we've taken a lot of the volume out of those dryers, which are usually the bottleneck in, in the plant. So we've got more gentle, lower temperature drying. So we've got a higher digestibility in, in those proteins. So that's it. We've got an excellent product. We've got all the nutritional values. We've got the trials work that has shown how well the product works in a range of this, uh, different species. We believe we've got a new protein product that you could formulate with and use as of now. Neil, I'm going to hand over to you just to, to finish off. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate that. I'm really here on a closing side, just want to kind of summarize everything together and kind of pull all the pieces parts together. And when you look at this, what's unique about the Still Pro 50, it, it is really that consistent, high value functional protein, that, that game changer that the industry, as Albert alluded to, is looking for, right? It is a high quality, uh, high nutrient, right? We, we've showed a lot of data and we have plenty more data out there if, if anyone needs it. The consistency across all the plants that are producing it. In fact, we have three plants in the U.S., one in Brazil. It's the same product in Brazil as it is in the U.S. and across the plants. To Pete's point, we've got the, you know, we can't, we constantly hear from some of the big, big major players out there. You just don't even have enough product yet for them to switch over. Uh, they like it, but they're looking for large, large quantities. Our, our big limitation is just the demand. Um, you know, you talk when we talk to our marketers, CHS, Split Hills, others, right? Their first thing is we need more of the product. We need more of the product, and that's why you know we're building more of these plants uh, and, and moving as, as quickly as we can. That yeast really adds a unique characteristic, and that's what I talked about before. This product is like nothing else out there. It's a patented product. It's unique. It's novel. It's protected. And so that functional uniqueness of it really drives the value. Um, we looked at, Pete did a great job looking at all different markets, all different livestock feed segments, and that's what you, that's the key about this product. It does go across all the different species, different rations within the species, and that's what's uniqueness is. It isn't a simple feed that can only go into one species. That's the problem you have with DDGS. It's an imperfect feed, right? It's too high in one ingredient, too low in another. This product is really balanced to, to have that protein density that's really required. Um, you know, you can, you can make those products out there. People talk about a, a mid-protein product, a 40% product. The problem with that is it still has 60% other materials that is not valued in the ration, and so it's hard to include a 40% protein uh, product in, in any great quantity and, more importantly, with any real premium. That's why those 40% protein products day in and day out only trade at a slight premium over DDGS. When I say slight premium, meaning a, a $10 or $20 a ton value, right? They are not trading at 3X multiplier like this product is. The other key thing is we have 10 years of data, 10 years of, 10 years of support of this product. We know it inside and out, and that really brings that uniqueness to it. And bottom line, too, is we have uh, exclusive marketing rela relationships with uh, several leading marketers out there to facilitate bringing this high quality, high value product to the marketplace, right? So it's not commoditized, so we don't destroy the value moving forward. So that when the 20th or 50th plant come online with the MSC technology, right, we're still getting the premiums above soybean meal like we are today, if not higher, as you've seen from the data that we've been driving. So again, really appreciate everyone's time and uh, and uh, sorry about the delay. We had some technical challenges getting things moving there, so we had to restart the uh, webinar, but do appreciate it. These are just a few of our, our partner companies 
that, that have been gracious to work with us over the years. And at this point, I believe, Tammy, we're going to do the uh, survey results. Thank you, Neo, Peter, and Albert. Um, yes, we're going to pull up the results from the polls that we conducted earlier in the webinar here, and I'll briefly go through those results. So, looking at what industries everyone is from, uh, we have ethanol producers at 29%, ag marketing at 1%, feed industry 10%, ethanol industry supplier at 24 and other at 36. Well, for our other poll, um, when we were talking about predictions for ethanol industry margins, we'll pull those ones up. So it looks like we have improving slightly, 45% of people um, predict that. The next highest would be staying the same as today, and that percentage is at 32. Then we've got uh, decreasing slightly at 17%, improving greatly at 6%, and decreasing greatly at 0%. Um, with those figures in mind, um, Neil, do you have some interpretation um, and a little bit of commentary maybe on, on our poll results here today? Yeah, first of all, thank you thank you for, for pulling that together. And it's great to see the diversity across the board on, on listening in on these webinars, and we do appreciate everyone's time. It is interesting on the margin environment. Uh, if you look at the data, it's pretty much split down the middle. It's that, you know, back to that slide I had about the crossroads and the inflection point of, of we have half the industry saying we're going to get better and half the industry, industry saying we're going to stay the same or get worse. And, you know, that, that's, I think, the, the, the underlying message here is, you know, what can we do differently? If we don't do anything, you know, that's a, that's, that's a re recipe disaster. That's a business 101. Do nothing, you won't survive, right? You have to do something. You have to make a change. You can't just continue to make only ethanol and, and, and DDGS and, uh, and oil. There's too many other headwinds and contraction and, 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 and challenges ahead that without a diversification strategy, without an investment to continue to grow the business, you know, the industry will be, will, you'll be challenged to move ahead. And that's what we're here to help. And, and, and if we can help come to facilities and help evaluate the optionalities you know, in front of the, the facilities, because we know every plant's unique, right? We know you talk to plants in Kansas, right? And you've got folks there that says, well, I can't change my DDGS. My, my, my cattle guys are going to scream. No, they're not. Let us come meet. Let us come talk to you guys. We'll meet with your cattle guys. We'll show them. Actually, we can get you a better product, right? And actually increase your revenue for those unique markets. Or if you're in a low, low uh, region or, where, or a region where you're looking for only CI score improvements because you want to go to California. So we absolutely have technologies that bolt on with the MSC to lower your CI score, lower your energy usage, and still and still make the, these unique and high value coal products. So lots of we see we see no shortage of opportunity out there, and that's what we're we like I said we see the the rebirth or the reincarnation of, of, of the ethanol industry going forward. But it's going to take some investments, but it's going to take due diligence to make the right investments and understand right that the differences out there. Questions, I think, are next, right, Tammy? Yes, yes, Neil, they sure are. And, and thank you for that commentary on, on our poll questions. I think that's an important uh, point to make. So we are going to dive right into questions. We have a, a lot of questions from our attendees today. So keep in mind, like I said at the beginning, if we don't get to all of these, which we likely won't, um, we will forward them to our panelists and they will be able to uh, answer those accordingly. So our first question is directed at Neil. How do you look at different grades of protein products from an ethanol facility? Is it just percentage of protein content? Excellent question. So excellent question there on the on the different grades of protein. Um, here's the key thing about protein, right? So when you go to measure protein, it is a it is a uh, the way the, the equipment works. It looks at the nitrogen. Right. And so when you when you measure protein, you have to cross check that with the amino acid. So if you take a sample of our protein, right, and it'll it'll measure 50 percent protein, then you do a detailed analysis of the individual amino acids. 
those amino acids better add up to 50% protein or something is not right, right? In other words, you've added something in there that has skewed the protein measurement, but has shorted, shorted the amino acid content. And that's a critical thing from a nutrition point of view. And Albert hit on this earlier, it's not just the protein content, it's understanding the, the amino acid balance. Uh, and making sure that adds up to your protein content. A perfect example of things out there, right? Everyone remembers the milk issue with China, right? They falsely increased the protein. They added a, a, a chemical. They added melamine, right? And so do you have that same situation here where you can add chemicals and get a false high protein reading, claim that you're 50% protein, but you're really your amino acid balance is only 45% or so. So you got to be really understanding the details of what's behind that measurement and, and understand the, the amino acids that, that, that make up that protein content. And also, last point, the digestibility of those amino acids. That's the other key driver to really peel back the onion, understand the true value. Thank you, Lisa. All right. Thank you, Neil. Moving on to our next question. How do mycotoxins in the corn transfer into the high pro feed? Generally, mycotoxins in corn are three times to four times in traditional DDGs. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that question because we've done a lot of work in that area too. Uh, basically, what you see with the mycotoxins is you do get that 3X concentration because of the starch is removed and uh, converted to sugar, converted to ethanol. What we see with the Still Pro 50 is we don't get a highest concentration of that mycotoxins into the Still Pro as you do with the DDG. There's about a 40 to 60% split versus a 50-50% split. So you do get stuff that carries over, which ultimately gets back to, you know, it, it, it's watching your corn that you're bringing into the plant. And the wet mills do a very good job of being disciplined in that area to make sure that they're getting high quality corn in and don't look at your ethanol plant as, so to speak, a dumping ground of low quality material coming in because you end up with low quality material coming out. All right. Um, next question here. Can you share the proportion of protein originating from yeast and corn in the Fluidquip Technologies premium protein product? Okay, it's Pete. Um, yeast has tr traditionally got a 44% protein. So uh, we're taking 25% of the dry matter is yeast. And if we've got 44% protein, then we've got a quarter of that protein actually coming from yeast. Okay? Okay. Next, oh, I'm sorry, did anyone else wanna weigh in on that one? No, I don't think so, uh, Lisa, no. Okay, all right, great. So moving on to our next question, is there an additional benefit such as health uh, to replacing or substituting an expensive fish meal with an emerging alternative protein product? Um, I, I'll uh, answer that one if I can, Lisa. Um, we all recognize that it is very difficult to replace fish meal. Um, fish meal has a unique combination of protein, energy, and minerals, but there has never been attributed to fish meal any what you might call functional characteristic that we now attribute to many different feeds. What do I mean by a functional characteristic? Yeast, I would recognize as a functional protein because it has recognized responses to the beta-glucans and the mannans in terms of an, an immune response. Indeed, we recognize that if we feed too much still pro 50, we believe that we can get a overstimulation of the immune response and we get a slight dip in performance. So you're, you're not comparing like with like when you start to look at an alternative protein and that uniqueness of fish meal. I hope that answers the question. Excellent, thank you, Pete. Um, next question here, how much SP50 can be produced in a 100 gallon per year ethanol plant? And what is the cost estimate for any additional hardware installation? Uh, I'll handle that, uh, Lisa. So on the, the yield piece, the key thing there is we can 
there's a variability, right? We can drive the yield as high as four, four and a half pounds of protein out of the back end of the plant. Some plants elect to, eat, to produce more because they still want to hit a, a certain pro-fat target within their DDGS. So it really depends on what that uh, plant ultimate goal is. Uh, and one unique thing we have seen, for example, one plant we worked with, initially they said, well, we want to hit a 34 pro-fat. Uh, their actually spec is now down to 31 and still have not seen any discount to their uh, mark to their to their DDG. Now they're in a slightly different feed market area, so it just depends where where ultimately your DDG goes. We see ultimately though it's kind of like the whole oil argument from years ago, where oh you take oil out you're gonna you're gonna hurt the DDG value. Well, we really never saw that, right? The bottom line is the DDG is undervalued. There's, you're not getting the true value for the product, and so we might as well continue to drive drive the, uh, the the product down to its true value by pulling out the other components. So we see ultimately the drive to go below 30% pro fat is the way to go long term in, in terms of driving value and still good still have an overall positive revenue gain for the DDGS as well as the protein products. And and sorry and to finalize on the cost it's it's a, the it, it is a variable variable depending on certain infrastructures and so we'd rather it's easiest for us to sit down and go through plant by plant and go walk through the cost structure for that. The new thing about the technology is you know we do have a ring dryer as part of it because we know the quality of the product you get with the with the ring dryer. We've tested many dryers out there and we know what the what some of the other dryers will do from a from a quality or, or lack thereof. And that does add a that does add a cost factor to the product. But when you look at the value we're attaining for the product in the in a in the growth of it, you know, these returns are still, you know, less than four years, less than three years in most cases. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question here. So the available lysine percentage was listed at 95%. Uh, and this question is, how has that been measured and which animal data is available? Okay, Lisa, I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> we use uh, the character, uh, well, uh, and then the analytical procedure that has been used in the industry for about the last 20 years. We measure carpenter lysine. So that measures the um, available lysine from a digestion point of view, and that is compared with the actual lysine measure that we find um, in, in the product. Um, so it is an analytical technique. It, is not, uh, it has not been measured in vivo, but it is a measure that is used by the industry and we're quite confident with. So it's the carpenter lysine. Thank you, Pete. Um, so we have a lot of questions here about CapEx and um, investments. I'm going to read through a few of these. The first one here is, what about the CapEx to make SP50? Um, again, it's a, it's a variable that's hard to answer emphatically here. It's more about the returns and the guarantees of the yield and the guarantees of the returns and the, and the robustness of the technology. Uh, you know, if you have a ring dryer in your process, you know, that's going to be a substantial cost savings if you don't. So there's just a lot of variability. It's really hard for us to answer that question, uh, depending on the plant location, things like that. So that's, it just, it's just too hard to answer that and give a very general. But the key sure. point there is, well, and I do want to stress to that to that question about the processes, the guarantees are, are the key thing, right? We guarantee the product. We guarantee the yields because we have multiple of these things are up and running, right? We're able to do that. And that's the key differentiator out there that people really need and should be, should be asking for. So the capital cost is a variable depending on the plant side and many other factors, electrical infrastructure, site infrastructure, things like that. Got it. Thank you. And, and if any of the attendees want some more specific information to their plants, they can contact uh, you, Neil. I think your contact information was on your, your last slide. Yep. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. 
Great. Okay. Um, Neil, this is another one for you, a, a clarification on a figure that you had discussed. You said the return on investment a $50 million investment would be repaid in 10 years. Um, is, is, are those the correct figures? And is that for a 100 million gallon per year plant? Um, I guess I got to clarify. Never, uh, no, we've never seen a 10 year payback on the technology. It's always been under four years for, uh, with the technology. So I'm not sure it's been running for 10 years. Um, and so the, the ROI is based on the uplift in, in the feed value relative to, relative to the DDG value. The other key point that drives the revenue is, is much higher oil yields. Uh, we push the oil yield to 1.1 to 1.3 range. Again, it depends on, on, on what you want to target for your final DDGS pro fat spec. Uh, so that so what's driving the returns is is the a the proven cost to build uh, because we we've done multiple of these and the and the proven value of the product and the yields of the product. Great, thank you. Um, talking about starch now, is the starch present in SP50 digestible starch? The starch content of the uh, SP50 is very low indeed. In, in actual fact, we're, I think we're less than 1% or 2% starch in the product because obviously the efficiency of the ethanol plant is very much based on uh, starch recovery. So, uh, and I couldn't give you whether this is resistant starch or totally available starch. It's a measure we haven't done. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Um, how much yeast remains in the post MSC DDGs? So roughly, um, when we look at the yield of, so an ethanol plant today produces about 0.7 to 0.8 pounds per bushel of yeast in the in the whole stillage. The uniqueness about the the MSC technologies, we capture roughly 90 percent of percent of that. So roughly about 0.1 pounds remains in the DDGS uh, product uh, post MSC system. Rough numbers. Great, thank you. Um, this next one is, is a little bit longer. Please provide a brief summary of the equipment, operations, and energy requirements for adding this process. So that would be electrical, heat, boiler, et cetera. Um, I, I, real quick, I'll, I'll give a, a high level, but this again is a question that really is unique to each individual plant uh, in terms of, of the equipment, the, the OPEX, electrical, it, those are all very, very, very large variabilities. Um, again, as I said early on from the equipment piece, it is the, the technology bolts onto the back end of an ethanol plant. It focuses on the whole stillage. It's a separation system. We don't add chemicals. We don't add anything that, that could adulterate the product or anything like that to do the separation. It's all mechanical separation based on particle, based on density, based on proven equipment operations. If you walk into a wet mill and walk into one of our MSC systems, you'll see the same type of equipment there. So the base system is all about separating the proteins from the, from the fiber and purifying the other key benefit. It purifies the thin stillage, right? So that allows you to get to have a, a huge advantage to your evaporators in terms of reduction of fouling and also allows you to yield a lot much higher oil. And then the other key thing is with the technology, again, we utilize the uh, a ring dryer because of the quality and because of the digestibility, which all drives the value of the uh, of the system. Be happy to sit down with anyone if they want to walk through and talk about a uh, talk about what their needs are, what they're looking at, and formulate a diversification strategy specific for your facility. Great, thank you. And anyone who does want to contact Neil, um, email I have his email address here. It's N J A K E L J A K E L at fluidquiptechnologies.com. So anyone who has a specific question who would like more uh, tailored answers for, for their specific plant can go ahead and contact Neil that way. Um, a follow-up question here, Neil, to what you were just talking about. Is the ring dryer an, an absolute requirement? It sounds like from what you just said that it, it might be and really does increase the quality. The, you know, the, the key thing there is, 
the quality and the consistency of the product drive value. As Albert and Pete both hit, hit on before, that's the number one driver out there. As we said, we've tested other dryers, right? We know the issues of trying to put this through your existing rotary dryers. Um, and because of that yeast content and because of the functionality, right, you can't, you, you can't, you can dry it, but you destroy the value. Um, and so that's a, there's a, there's a big trade off in terms of, yeah, you know, the uniqueness of the product and the value is what we're, is what we're bringing to the table and that discipline of how to make it so that whether plant A, plant D or plant Z makes it, it's the same product that can go into the same formulation across the board. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question here. Uh, Neil, you had initially commented that this technology will reduce the carbon intensity. Um, how and, and what is that based upon? Sorry. Um, so on the CI from a lower carbon intensity, um, they, the, what the technology allows us to do is look at some unique integrations within your evaporation, with, within distillation, to help drive costs down. Because of the cleanliness and, and what we're doing with the technology, there's a couple different uh, options that we can bring in and incorporate into the base design to lower that that energy cost, lower the uh, lower the electrical usage. Looking at things such as you know, as a, if you don't have one today, looking at a, a gas turbine or other unique things like that that allow us to drive the uh, CI score down. The one big thing with CI score is the denominator, right? This technology allows the plants, you know, assuming other restrictions are, are, are not there, allows these plants to produce 10 to 15 percent more throughput because we dramatically clean up the back set that's coming back around into fermentation. So because the denominator gets larger, it allows for uh, it allows for uh, it allows for a lower CI score. And then the other key thing is, you know, we look at this as kind of a multi-stage approach, right? Put the technology in first get the cash coming into the plant, get that EBITDA up, right? Start paying off that first investment, allows you now have free cash flow to now look at these energy projects to, right, to further reduce your CI score if that's a driver for you, depending on the market you're in. Excellent, thank you. Since we started a few minutes late today because of our technical difficulties, I am going to read through a few more questions. Um, so this next one is, what is the pound per bushel breakdown of DDGs and of SP50? Um, so, you know, in, in general terms, we typically see if you want to leave your, 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 and again, this is very plant specific. It varies. Again, we'll be glad to sit down with anyone and walk through it. Um, rough numbers, roughly three pounds a bushel yield still yields you around a 34 pro fat again that's plant specific there's plants that uh, that are slightly lower than that there are plants that higher that are higher than that yield um, but that's if you want to target that 34 pro fat like i said we have plants that aren't targeting that they're going lower and lower because the the 3x value of the protein over ddgs drives that decision to move forward to make to maximize that protein yield so basically, it's a simple mass balance. Let's say you start with 14 pounds uh, of, of DDGS. You're moving three pounds over into this high value component of protein, right? You're still, and you're taking a little bit more on your oil yield. Let's say you're 0.7 pounds today. You can easily go to probably 1.1, 1.2. That's another half pound of material of oil. So it's a net three and a half pounds different from your 14 pound base roughly. So those are just broad, simple numbers. Again, glad to sit down with anyone and go through your specific facility, your specific needs uh, on a case by case basis. Great, thank you. Um, one more question here and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. What is control and premium in the bar chart results on the 500 Atlantic salmon diet trial? The, what is the control on the Atlantic salmon? So the control was the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the values are actually given in the diet formulations. So you've got a 28% uh, poultry byproduct meal, 25% fat, 
fish meal, herring fish meal, and then the other um, ingredients. Now, the, stan uh, the standard errors, the, um, there is no significant difference between the control, the 5 and the 10% um, SP50 um, inclusion levels. Uh, so there is no significant difference there. I'm sorry I haven't put the standard errors in, and I can provide those for you if you'll drop me an email. Excellent. Can Thank I, you. Can I just make, we, oh. Lisa, just one small comment on that. Yes. Um, Absolutely. We weren't able to do, get any significance around the growth rates. And the other thing that we did measure was the mortality across the treatments. Um, now, it's, again, it's very difficult to do a significant difference on mortality. But we've seen this now on several different trials, where when we put the yeast in, we've actually got a lower mortality. And you can see that from the mortality figures on those, that histogram. We get a low mortality when we've got that functional yeast component in the protein. It's not a me something I've been able to measure statistically, but it's something that we have consistently seen across different trials. Great, thank you. And, and anyone who would like some more details on that and would like to reach out to Pete, his email address is pwilliams, that's P-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, at fluidquiptechnologies.com. So that wraps up the Q&A portion of our webinar. A big thank you again to Neil, Albert, and Peter. A huge thank you again to our sponsor, Fluidquip Technologies. We have an exclusive offer today for webinar attendees, 10% off exhibit space at next year's International Fuel Ethanol Workshop and Expo. So call the number on your screen. Be sure to mention webinar to get that discount. A few other events coming up that you should have on your radar, the North Dakota Energy Conference and Expo is November 13th and 14th. That's in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Biomass Magazine's editorial preview webinar is coming up on November 6th. And Ethanol Producer Magazine's editorial preview webinar for 2020 is coming up November 7th. That preview for Biodiesel Magazine is November 20th. And of course, the FEW coming up June 15th and 15th through 17th of 2020, and that's being held in Minneapolis. Thank you again to all of our speakers, our sponsor, Fluidquip Technologies, and all the attendees who joined us today. Enjoy the rest of your day.